Alright, Colossians chapter 1. Lord willing, we'll finish up Colossians chapter 1 and begin in chapter 2. This evening. Colossians chapter 1, and we're verse 25 29. Father, please, O oh Lord, bless, Lord, our time spent here expounding upon your word. Lord, let it accomplish your purpose and will in all of our lives, Lord. But truths, Lord, from your word, stay in our hearts and in our minds, and help to change our lives for your glory. Pray and ask for it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, 25 to 29. Whereby I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Verse 25, whereof I am made a minister. Okay. The whereof is the church, as mentioned in the preceding verse, verse 24. To minister is to look after and to care for the object receiving the ministry. In Paul's case, this is his being the apostle of the Gentile church. Every believer, as I've said so many times before, is given at least one gift to minister to the church with. Romans 12, 6, 7, and 8. Romans 12, 6, 7, and 8. Having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth, with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. This is why I continually will encourage each and every one of you to know what your gift or gifts are that the Holy Spirit of God has given to you okay? and to put them to work for the edifying of the church. Back in our text, the verse goes on, According to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now, there is not a dispensation called God. Uh, uh, I heard somebody say, oh, you know, the dispensation of... You know, read, read the English. <laughs> okay. Paul is clearly relating to the fact that God dispensed to him something. That something are the seven mysteries of the New Testament church which are the foundation of the doctrine of the church of Jesus Christ. Of course we've gone over those many times. I mean those seven ministry, uh, mysteries are how God okay, if you want to, again using the word dispensation like we've been teaching in Sunday school you know, is how God is ordering his house 
during the time frame which is the time frame that the church is on the earth and operating on the earth in its mystery form within the kingdom of God those seven mysteries and this is to fulfill God's will concerning the church okay and that will be that the church number one okay here are those three things again and God keeps giving me those over and over and over again so he's hammering on it for a good reason okay the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ okay for the church to edify itself in its service to the Lord and in being conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ and to proclaim the gospel of salvation of God's grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ so that whosoever will can be saved that that is the point and purpose behind all these things Okay. Verse 26 goes on and talks about the mystery hid from ages and from generations that is now made manifest okay, to its saints okay, is that God himself would be manifest in the flesh as, promise, as the promised woman's seed. Uh, you know, that's 1 Timothy 3.16. That's the great mystery. God manifests in the flesh. And that he would become our sacrifice and pay our sin debt and make possible our redemption and our reconciliation to God. If this was not known to the Old Testament saints. They didn't know this, I think. Right? This whole baloney of, you know, we all get saved the same way all throughout human history. Well, that's not so. And we know that's not so. You just have to read the scriptures and believe what it says. They did not know this. Okay? They weren't looking forward to the cross with us looking back at the cross. Okay. No, they were looking for a conquering king. Okay. They were looking for, for the triumphant Messiah to come and put the Gentiles down and, 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 and to sit on the throne of David and to put Israel back you know, up, uh, you know, in, in the glory that God had promised them. That's going to happen, but not right now. They didn't know anything about the church age. They didn't know that that was going to happen. They just knew that the Christ of God would somehow set everything right again. They couldn't see through that veil that had been put over their face you know, uh, to blind their spiritual eyes. You know, even to, I mean, they can, you know, we sit and we read Isaiah chapter 53 and well, we have no, we can see there. We see Christ on it in every bit of that. We fully understand it. Man, it's blind as a bank. They don't get it. Eyes are blinded. This is why they were so in doubt of this lowly carpenter's son, as they believed, who was proclaiming himself to be the promised Messiah, at being the Christ. And they're, they're like, I thought we were looking for, you know, basically for David to come back, the glorious conquering king, not this carpenter's son, <laughs> you know, who doesn't, doesn't even own anything other than what he's got on his back. You see? Yeah, because they were blind to the scriptures. They were blind to the scriptures. They missed all the clues that were given, you know, because they had a preconceived human conception of how God's plan was going to play out. And the man, Jesus Christ, didn't meet that preconceived idea. 
you know, and because they didn't believe what the scriptures said, and instead were looking for what they wanted the scriptures to mean, and that's always man's problem right there when it comes to the Bible, instead of believing what the Bible says, they want to try to make it mean what they want it to mean. They completely missed John the Baptist's declaration of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. And it went right over the head of almost all of them. No idea what he's talking about. What do you mean, the Lamb of God will take away the sin of the world? No grasp, no understanding. You know, that this is the Son of God. Okay? God in the flesh come to pay the price for man. They didn't get it. It's right over their head. And even those few that did get it. You know, remember Christ asking the apostles, who do you say that I am? You know, to old Peter, right over the thou art the Christ of God. You know? Uh, even after his death and his burial and his resurrection, they're still looking for him to immediately restore the kingdom to Israel. They're still looking for a king and a kingdom. They didn't know one thing about this mystery of the church. Had no idea whatsoever about that back in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, 7, and 8. Had no idea for what the plan of God was. And I'm going to tell you what. There's some of what's coming in the future that we have no idea about. We could read it and read it and read it over again. There's some of this stuff here that ain't going to make any sense to anybody in the church age. Now, folks in the tribulation, it's going to mean something to them. Some of it still just not there for us. Yeah, but again, this is why, again, Acts 1 through 7 is a transitional period. It allows for a full realization of the transformation of the church from those 130 Jewish disciples there in that upper room on Pentecost into the uniquely Gentile organism that are called Christians first in Antioch, Syria. Verse 27. Christ in you the hope of glory. Now that is one of those seven mysteries given to the church. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Jesus Christ is in us. We are in Him. Now I know there's a lot of times you don't feel like it. But that doesn't change the fact of it. Not one bit. We are His body. He is our body. Head, okay? We walk by faith, not by sight. We believe the facts. Okay? We aren't looking for feelings. We aren't looking for signs. Okay? We are one. Just as the mystery of a man and a woman becoming one flesh in marriage. Again, Ephesians 5. Over to John 17. Again, Lord's Prayer. Real Lord's Prayer. John 17, 22, 23. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. On redemption we became a permanent fixture within the Godhead itself. I don't know, you may not feel that. <laughs> But that's the fact of it. This is our hope. This is our confidence. 
Okay? Because this is our eventual glorification. Again, back there uh, in, in, in John 17, you're still there. I've got to flip back here real quick. And so verse 24, where it keeps going. And he said, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of of the world. John 14, first three verses. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now we are already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man, the charge that we have been given and are to strive to fulfill is to ensure that the gospel of Jesus Christ goes out to the whole world. That is our command. Verse goes on and says, teaching every man in all wisdom. Well, those who heed the gospel okay, are all to be discipled and will be taught sound doctrine. And if we can't teach every man all wisdom, okay, then they ain't going to listen. Okay. The ones who listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ, those who trust Jesus Christ, those that get saved, then we take that next step with them of discipleship and teaching them that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's the goal. First, perfect in salvation in Jesus Christ. That's the first step of perfection. Second, perfect in their walk <coughs> in Jesus Christ. The whole point behind sound doctrine and edification. Go to Philippians 3. Back a few pages. Philippians 3, verses 8 through 14. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. That's why the hearing about these pastors in Cuba quitting. Because it's tough there economically. Really? For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. And be found in him 
not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Eternal security. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the new man, and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain under the resurrection of the dead. He's not talking about attaining under the resurrection of the dead. We're gone. No, it's not about in this life. Being dead to the flesh and alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Not as though I had already attained. This is the Apostle Paul. Either were already perfect. But I follow after that if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The high calling of God in Christ Jesus be conformed to the image of Christ. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. Okay, if you're saved, you are. Be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. The goal is not to just get by. Or to just make it in by the skin of our teeth. Oh, I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. I, you know, I'm not going to have much to... No. no. That, that shouldn't be your mentality whatsoever. The mentality should be to excel. To excel. Mediocrity is the hallmark of Laodicean Christianity. Verse 29. Whereunto I also labor, Paul's constant concern okay, is the care of all the churches, as it says in 2 Corinthians 11, 28. Whereunto I also labor. Go to Hebrews 13, verse 17 with me. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Also, 2 Corinthians 12, 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Any conscientious pastor's concern is the spiritual well-being of those whom he's been given charge of by the Lord. That is their labor. And if they are conscientious pastors, then it's what consumes much of their prayers, much of their thoughts, and much of their time. Striving according to his working. This labor and striving must be done in accordance with the Lord's will. The Lord's manner and the Lord's means. Because the church are the Lord's sheep. And the pastor is to care for them as the Lord would have them cared for. He must feed them, love them, and care for them as the Lord would have it done. And not as he would have it done. Yes, and I use the male personal pronoun. Continuing verse 29. Okay? The purpose 
The purpose is so that the Lord receives from the sheep as he desires, and that the sheep receive from the Lord as he desires. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4. 1 Peter chapter 5, first four verses. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. He's talking about when Christ's glory was revealed there on the, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. That crown is unique to and solely for the pastors who have fulfilled their duty to the chief shepherd. And it's one I desire. Chapter 2. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Let's see if we can't get through those here this evening. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches, and of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul, in carrying out his appointed task as the apostle of the Gentiles, found himself in great and almost constant conflict from numerous enemies. His flesh, quite often, Second Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Stay in 2 Corinthians, go to chapter 7, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 3. Five. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, we're thin, we're fears. Go to the book of Romans, chapter 7. Picking up verse 15. Here, again, Paul talks about himself. But this battle is common to every believer. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law, then it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good. I find not. And if we go down, verse 24 and 25, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. That's why we need to bring the flesh under control and not let it have its way. Okay. Enemies of the world. You know, Acts chapter 9, verse 25, where he, the Jews in Damascus, the believers in Damascus, had to let him down over the city wall because the unbelieving Jews there were trying to catch him and kill him. They let him in a, well, a basket tied with a rope. You know? I mean, Sanhedrin in Jerusalem want him dead. The Romans are persecuting him. The heathen are persecuting him. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.14. 
Second Timothy. Chapter 4, verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Uh, 2 Corinthians again, chapter 11. Some more that we read about. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequent, in death awe. Of the Jews, <coughs> excuse me, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. For sake of time, I'll just give you the references, but if you read in Acts 15, verses 1 and 2, and again in 2 Timothy you know, the false brethren. You know, Acts 15, it's the Jews that were going around behind him that were trying to teach uh, the Gentile believers that they had to keep the law. Second Timothy, you know, he talks about uh, those that have been telling the Thessalonians, Thessalonians, I can't talk straight tonight, Thessalonians, there you go, uh, that they had, they had missed the rapture. <coughs> And then, of course, the devil. Acts chapter 16, 